So thank you very much. I'm uh, Rohini Pandey. I'm one of the members of the development community here at Yale. And so on behalf of all of us, thank you for coming. We've had a great day of discussions. So I want to just first start, because I know these things get lost otherwise, is by thanking a number of people who really helped make this what it is. So our deputy director at EGC, Eshwarya Ratan, and she and Gillian Stallman have really um, led from the front on this. So thank you to both of them. On our comms team, uh, Wessel McIntyre, and then helping with a lot of the finance stuff was Dave Cowell. We had a bunch of volunteers who, as you've seen in the rooms throughout the day, so I want to thank them as well. And finally, Shannon, who's really been helping us a lot on the Yale side. So thank you very much. I think none of this would have been possible without all of that. Um, before we get started, I also wanted to share that next year, NUDC will be held at Harvard. So we have a location for it, and hopefully um, the weather will be almost as good. But we'd like you to remember Yale as the place with the best weather. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, let me start really, um, I'm going to stop for a very little amount of time, but I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes on why we chose to do this plenary panel on the lessons learned on poverty, poverty measurement through household panel surveys. So I think increasingly what you hear in a lot of talk about is you know, the excitement around big data and the many ways in which uh, big data and combinations of field experiments can be used to learn many features of development. But in the end, I think there's also a lot of recognition that development is a very long run process. And if we both want to learn about how these processes evolve and how people cope, for instance, with shocks and crises, it's going to be critical to have long run data collection enterprises. And this is something actually, when Chris, when he was uh, here, he and Mark Rosenzweig very deliberately put in place a system to collect um, long run data in Ghana and India. And we're delighted that today is an occasion where in addition to hearing about much of this data collection, we are also able to announce the public release of the first three waves of the Ghana panel. And so for those of uh, you who are more technologically savvy than me, apparently if you scan that QR code there, you will be able to be led directly to the Dataverse site that now has the first three waves of the Ghana panel. So let me start by just briefly introducing our speakers and then I'll hand it over to Chris Udry. So we're going to start with some opening comments from uh, Chris Udry, who is the Robert E. and Emily King Professor of Economics at Northwestern. I really think Chris needs no introduction, but he's really been a pioneer, I think, and an inspiration for many of us and in demonstrating how you can both um, you know, collect long-term panel data, but also I think bring together many different approaches um, to help us learn about development trajectories. After he introduces it, he's going to hand it over to his two colleagues at Northwestern, Andre Nikau and Sam Ampau. Andre Nikau is a research manager at the Global Poverty Research Lab, and he received his PhD from Northwestern in 2017. His interests span a wide range within development studies with a special focus in evaluation methodology and political economy. We'll, he will combine his presentation with Sam Ampau, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the GPRL, and his research focuses on poverty, healthcare, health, education, digital technologies, and non -farm, farm entrepreneurship. He received his PhD from Nottingham, and before that, his degrees from University of Ghana. After we hear about the Ghana panel, we're going to turn to Graciela uh, Terul, who is going to talk to us about the Mexican Family uh, Life Survey, which, as many of you may know, is an extremely impressive panel survey that has been used in many papers. Graciela is the director of the Research Institute of Social Development and Equity of Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City. She holds a PhD in economics from UCLA. And then finally, we'll turn to um, our own Mushfik Mubarak, uh, who is the professor of economics at Yale and at SOM. So I'm not worried about him getting lost and getting his way here. <laughs> so he will hopefully come soon. And he's going to talk to us about the Cox's Bazaar uh, panel, which is a panel of refugee migrants. And so I think quite a different uh, setting. But with that, let me hand it over to Chris. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And this is an it's an exciting day to have the Ghana panel publicly released. Um, 
And so there was a time that high quality data from low and middle income countries was really scarce. Uh, w. Arthur Lewis and Esther Bozrop could change the way we looked at the world by having a few tables of data from customs records and a few anthropology uh, case studies. Um, this weekend makes it abundantly clear that that's just not true anymore. There's the, 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 the rich, the rich data that's available from RCTs, from expenditure surveys, from administrative data, from remote sensing data, um, their, their availability is facilitating really rapid progress in how we understand the world. In this uh, setting of, of, of rich data, um, as Rohini actually started to, to mention, what's the use of these um, big, household panel survey data, data sets. Um, when Mark and I started thinking about this, um, our goal was to set up a lab in which people could think about development in, in new ways. We thought that by committing to a very long-term, comprehensive and coordinated set of studies that obtain individuals, uh, that, that obtain data on individuals' life course, um, as they move through the process of development and the built and natural environment in which they're operating, we could provide tools that would lead to unexpected insights, that we'd find things that we didn't know um, were happening. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm hoping these data can be used for. Um, can we, I actually have, a, I have two slides I wanna show. Yeah, two. Um, a blank one. <laughs> No, you have to go back. No, <laughs> that's what I want. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is what panel data gets you of it fundamentally. It, 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 get, it gets you what's happening to an individual over time. Um, and so that's just a, a scatter plot of uh, food expenditure per adult equivalent in households in wave one and wave three of the Ghana panel data. So those are separated by uh, for a 12 years. Um, and so there's guys in the upper left who started off quite poor and are now doing very well. There's guys in the lower right who were doing pretty well in wave one and are doing badly now. What's, what distinguishes them? What, what, what's driving this? Um, and so that, that's the sort of fundamental thing that we know about from panel data. We can track people over time and, and see, what's, see what's happening. What, is unique about the data sets that we'll be talking about uh, today is the breadth of, of information that we have about these same individuals. Um, so uh, Sam and Andre are gonna talk to you about some of the specifics. Let me just give you an example. We asked people, what do you think about when you fall asleep at night? And they told us. Um, and so here's, here's, here's the words that come up most for uh, people in households that have done better over time, that, that have gone from that lower right, that, that are in the, the upper left of that scatter plot they have. Um, and here's, here's the words that were mentioned more by the ones who were falling. Um, and I don't know if this means anything. <laughs> this is not actually something that I'm gonna study. But the, the, the point is that by drawing together information from various widely dispersed parts of people's lives, we might make unexpected connections. This is gonna come up later, um, I think, when we have a discussion. But so let me now turn it over to Sam. All right, thank you, Chris. So I have a text to introduce briefly the Ghana panel. And I'll do that with Andre. We have five minutes each, so I'll skip or not go into so much details. We can talk about that later. So this is the outline we are using. So we will look at the sampling design and attrition, the instruments, and then the topics um, covered under the Ghana panel, and then the field procedures. And then Andre would come in with some descriptive statistics and um, some exploratory transition analysis. Okay, so. So the Ghana panel follows a two-stage um, sampling procedure. The first stage was the 
um, selection of clusters, three, three, four clusters. And in each of these clusters, we had 15 households selected. So that gave um, a total of 5,010 households. Okay, so there is a unique feature um, I would want to highlight here, which is we track moved households and split off household members, that is breakaway household members. I'm sure you might be, there's something puzzling going on there. Why would we have 5,009, 4,774, and then 5,669? You might be guessing. So the next slide would show us what is happening. So you find that indeed in the wave one, we had 5,009 um, surveyed households, but moving to the wave two, we find that of that um, sample, 643 are treated for various reasons. It could be the death of all the household members, um, refusal, there could be migration outside Ghana, or we were just not able to reach these households. Okay, so that was it. And so you also find that for the split of um, household members, we had 965 but we don't trace all of them we don't follow all of them so we randomly select some to follow okay so that is how come we still ended up with the 4774 but we were the same thing happened but we we're fortunate for the third wave to have located 396 households who were not located in the um, second wave so that is how come we have a greater than number for the third wave so i'll move on yeah so um the instrument we started using um, computer assisted personal interviewing since the wave two. The first wave was a paper based, and for the wave two, we used Blaze. And um, beyond that, we used um, Survey CTO for both the wave three and then um, four. Okay, so um, here are some topics um, you can find in the Ghana panel. And we, for the fourth wave, we have introduced some new questions, which uh, I mean, we find relevant in recent times. So Ghana recently introduced some um, policies and we think it best to include such questions. So an example is, the, is this um, electronic transaction levy. So we wanted to know what people thought of it and then some feedback, because this was very controversial. And then there's also the planting for food and jobs. So we ask questions also on that. And we also include social media questions. Okay, so if anyone is also interested in um, internet speed data, we have it in there. So um, quickly, the field procedure, I'll just run through it because I have just two minutes left. So like I said, we have the household tracking. We did, this is mainly for the way four. We did this first, we used phones um, to track the households to know if they are still where they are before we went on to look for them. So that is what proceed. I mean, start, we started with, and then we had the teams and then we put them together and then we do these, um, we follow these protocols. We do a district entry, community entry, and then a, a, an in-person tracking once the um, teams are in the communities. So I'll just keep to also, once they submit the data, we go through some quality checks. We can think of high frequency checks. Um, we do that. Um, it, it seems like a real-time data quality check. So once they submit the data to us, we go through and then check for potential outliers. For instance, there are times for several reasons, tiredness, you could, you could find age being 3000. That doesn't really sound um, right. So we prompt them and then we go through this. And then we also have the back checks where we call back the surveyed households to ask I mean, same, some questions, for instance, we could ask the household, um, we could ask for the number of plots and just to see if it corresponds with what the, we have in the data submitted by the field team. And also we have the high frequency, I'm sorry, we have the field monitoring, yeah. So um, this study is, um, we started um, integrating RCTs into the Ghana panel of starting um, with a third wave. And this is one study which I think Chris and in some other quarters um, did. So I am particularly interested in this, or I find it exciting because what it does is that it shows how um, livelihood support during pandemics could lead people to adhere to um, public health directives. And so in this case, it used the COVID-19 and then social distancing. Okay, so the question is, um, if we give these um, monies to people, are they likely to social distance? And it finds positive um, effects. So I'll turn over to Andre now for him to go through. Thank you.
You go. Forward. Uh, forward like I said. Um, so thanks very much. Uh, this has been a great conference so far. And um, I'm just going to use the next few minutes to talk about a few of the types of exploratory data analysis that can be um, very quickly, readily, easily done with Ghana panel data. Um, so we decided to take three example variables that represent different um, types of, you know, different um, first, we have the food consumption per capita, which is some across all food types of purchased, um, received as gift and produced food. Um, then we have the probability of poverty index as a proxy for poverty, um, which gives the percentage probability that a household falls below a particular, um, let's say, prosperity threshold. In this case, we're using the national poverty line. And then third, the Kessler distress scale, um, sorry, the probability of poverty index comes from 10 questions of um, assets, um, household size, uh, that kind of thing. Um, the Kessler has 10 questions about how often in the past month um, people have felt um, you know, depressed, anxious, um, et cetera. And the idea is that it's a non-clinical construct that's associated with um, clinical constructs like anxiety and depression. Um, so as you can see for um, food consumption went way up between um, food consumption is also adjusted for um, CPI, I should mention, um, went way up between waves one and two, but then back down um, waves two and three. Um, similarly, the Kessler went down between um, waves one and two, which is good. That means less distress, um, but then back up just a little wave three. Um, PPI went down consistently, um, but only a little bit between waves two and three. Um, so that we could have seen from cross sections, but um, to take up some of the themes that Chris was showing in his um, graph, um, we can also look at poverty transitions or just more generally development trajectories and stories of particular households and understanding um, what's associated with upward mobility and downward mobility. Um, so here um, for each of the three variables, we um, reduce the sample to only households that we can link between waves one and three. Um, and then we take above and below median on the outcome in question for waves one, same for wave three. Um, and because it's going to be symmetrical here, we're only showing the um, below median in wave one. Um, so this also gives a chance to compare mobility of these three outcomes. Um, as food consumption, you can see there's a good amount of mobility. Um, PPI, not so much, 79% of the households who were below median in wave one um, stayed below median in wave three, um, and then Kessler, also more mobility. So of course, we can't say for sure what's measurement error and what's actually capturing things. Um, PPI should be more precise, but also um, because of the, the types of questions asked, um, but also since it involves durable assets, there's likely something real going on. Um, so now to break this out, just one more step. Um, one of the biggest uh, social distinctions we could say in Ghana is north versus south, social and geographical and agroecological. Um, so there's a lot going on here. Um, and so we want to see is mobility higher for Northern or for Southern, um, et cetera. So, um, so now starting with food consumption, um, we can see that in the South below median, there's a good amount of mobility. Um, a lot of people in, who are below median in South and wave one were above median by wave three. Um, but the situation was not so great for below median households in the North. Um, they were overwhelmingly still below median uh, by wave three, 12 years later. Um, and then a similar story for above and um, below. Now we're not controlling for regional price differences, so that could be part of this. Um, but as we'll see, the pattern's the same for PPI for below median, uh, not so much for above median. So this is a much starker table, as you can see, uh, especially point you towards the second row where 96% of the households who are below median in the PPI index in wave one stayed below median in wave uh, three. And so then um, psychological distress, on the other hand, there's a lot more movement. And so, of course, we're thinking not only about the actual trends, but about how these different variables are capturing different constructs that might vary more quickly in real life. And we're thinking about potential threats to um, uh, you know, me uh, measurement error and other validity concerns. Um, so these are some um, density plots like um, Chris showed, and you can see on the left, we have the south. Um, most of the households are above the line, meaning that they had experienced upward mobility, um, and it's the opposite for the 
So, so I'll actually wrap up there. There are some other interesting findings with farms and um, plots, but um, yeah, so we very much hope that y'all use the data and share the results with us um, and maybe even pre uh, present them next year at any UDC. So thank you very much. Rasila will now turn to you to talk about their experiences in Mexico. Sure. So, um, can you put the, yeah, uh, in the slide deck for coming up? Well, um, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to be here. I'm going to be talking about poverty measurement in Mexico and specifically using the Mexican Family Life Survey. So, um, one second. Uh, the How do I do it? That was, that was really the green one. Yeah, there oh, there it is. Okay. All right, so um, poverty measurement in Mexico official is done by CONAVAL, the Mexican Council for the Evaluation of Social Policy, and they have a mandate. It has to be done every two years uh, at, the, at the national level and at the state level, and they have to use official data coming from the National Bureau of Statistics, and uh, the indicators have to be decomposable. And it has uh, it, the, the National Bureau of Statistics produces the income expenditure survey, which is a series of cross sections. So what we use is actually that information to produce the official uh, measurement. So this is uh, basically the methodology that we use. So we have on the um, X axis social deprivation, which goes from the right to the left. If you have one, two, three, four, five, six social deprivations, and on the um, y axis, you have basically income, economic well being. So the interaction between these two dimensions is what gives uh, you poverty. So uh, extreme poverty is the red box, and it's, it basically is three deprivations or more and below a minimum income level. And it's basically 10% of the population uh, across all years in the last 10 years is basically the same. Uh, and then we have uh, moderate poverty, which is if you have at least one deprivation and you're below this uh, upper income level, so you're moderately poor, and it's basically 36% of the population in that quadrant. And then uh, the rest of the country is divided into non-poor, which is the green uh, quadrant, which is basically 19%. And then you have the vulnerable by income, which is like 5% of the population, which is those below the income poverty line, but no social deprivation or the vulnerable by uh, social deprivations, which are those that have high, high income, but have some sort of uh, deprivation. So basically, if you look at poverty measurement in Mexico, the, the indicators, they don't typically change across time. And um, so the question is, uh, we don't know anything about poverty transition. So we see 10%, 10%, 10% of people being in extreme poverty. And the question is whether there's actually no mobility out of poverty. Are people living in extreme poverty able to ever get out of poverty or not? So we're gonna use the uh, MXFLS, which is this longitudinal study to try to answer uh, and look at some of these questions. So. Uh, if a person is born poor, will she or, or, or he uh, die being poor? Is there social mobility as measured by these changes in poverty status? And is there a way uh, out of poverty? So I'm going to present some of the, the exercise that we did to try to answer uh, this question. So we're gonna use the Mexican Family Life Survey, which is the only uh, uh, nationally representative panel, multi-topic purpose survey in Mexico, and uh, it allows to study associations between different indicators of welfare because it has everything you can think of, I'm sure it has. So you can go into the web, I'm not, I, I don't have a lot of time to, to go into a lot of details, but it collects uh, biomarkers, objective and subjective indicators of health, um, interviews everyone in the, in the household as opposed to the representative respondent. And it also collects information about the community crisis and infrastructure at the local level. It's a, a longitudinal survey, as I said, it relocates and reinterviews baseline, uh, the baseline sample collected in 2002. And uh, it tracks individuals both within Mexico and into the United States. So there's three waves. We actually fielded, started fielding a fourth wave in, uh, in 
uh, in 2018, but uh, we, the, it's really painful to say this, but the government actually cut funding and we couldn't even finish the, the fourth wave. So it's basically like half done. Uh, approximately, we started collecting 35,000 individuals in the baseline and we're about 40,000 40, respondents uh, by the last wave. So uh, I'm not gonna talk about this because I don't have a lot of, uh, Time. The only thing that I'm going to say is that why are longitudinal uh, data useful for the study of measurement? So as Chris was saying, is obviously to track individuals across time and to see, look at transitions in and out of poverty. That's uh, one advantage. And another one is that since it's the same households across time, you can use information from different waves to complement and to uh, to to complement the study of um, of poverty measurement. So for example, we use um, expenditure as opposed to income because uh, we followed these people uh, along the years and we, we thought and we uh, proved that it was better to use expenditure when using uh, poverty measurements. But also, for example, we didn't have information about food deprivation in all the waves, only in the third wave. So we use that information to model food deprivation in the first two waves. So that's one of the advantages. So I'm not gonna stop on this. So what are the social deprivation? It's access to education, health, social security, housing, basic, basic services, and food. So we're gonna use this um, definition of uh, poverty in Mexico. And uh, well, I'm just gonna show you, I, can, I, don't, I cannot really stop here, but if you use MXFLS as a cross-section and compare to what indicators are obtained using the carnival, the efficient measures, uh, the numbers are basically very similar. So um, we're going to use, for this exercise that I'm gonna show you, we're gonna classify poverty into four groups. Uh, the first is uh, chronic poverty. So those are that in the three waves were always classified as poor. Then we have the persistent poverty. So comprised of people who experience poverty in two of the three uh, waves and transitory poverty, those who uh, were uh, classified as poor in one, and then non-poor, never classified as poor. So, so we basically have all these kinds of combinations across the three waves. And so what are the results that we get? So this is, uh, how is, how is it distributed among these four groups? So it's basically mm -hmm. 25, uh, percent almost equally distributed between the four groups and another way of reading it is that 75 percent of the population in Mexico in this la this 10 years of the study period have been poor at least once so this is a, a, a different way of interpreting these results and if you look at for example uh, the extreme poverty which is the the lowest one Extreme chronic poverty is less than 2% in Mexico. Extreme persistent poverty, 5%. Transitory, 16%. So another way of putting it is that one out of every five people in Mexico have been in extreme poverty in this last, uh, in this study period of 10 years. So, um, so people, if, if you look at, for example, at the official poverty measurements, in, um, in Mexico, those, are, those official indicators are used to delineate or design public policies. So public policies based on those first graphs that I show you or those first statistics uh, guide you to very different policies as if you used these uh, longitudinal or panel uh, results. So the, the, the conclusions would be different. So um, public policy is currently designed by using these static groups. So policies aimed at helping these groups may be focused only on short-term poverty, poverty alleviation and not looking at the structural causes of poverty. So that's something that uh, can be done. I'm not going to stop at this. I, I will share my slides later with you guys so you can see um, what the data looks like in terms of the chronicity of uh, poverty. But determinants of current poverty differ significantly from determinants of transitory poverty. Um, sorry. 
And they're very, they're very different depending obviously on the income poverty line that you use. Poverty in general is associated with a number of adults in the households because those are the ones working and those are the ones that are generating income. But uh, specifically chronicity of poverty is very much associated with schooling and health conditions. So more schooling and better health leads to lower chronicity of uh, poverty as one would expect. So uh, employment and particularly formal employment are the cornerstone for permanent poverty reduction. So let me just go to the last slide, which talks about the lessons learned. And I would say that longitudinal approaches give more information and information that is more suited in order to uh, delineate or design uh, effective public policies. Uh, this multi-purpose component also adds um, a lot because you can use a lot of uh, a breadth of, of social demographic indicators to uh, to design these anti-poverty pr uh, uh, projects. And um, typically, and this is something that I will just be my, my last comment that I think <laughs> is something very nice for you guys working on these topics is that um, a lot of our countries, especially in Latin America, are suffering, are suffering from our democracies are suffering and are, uh, we're shaking. And also the data collection is shaking in our countries. And uh, there's some countries in Latin America that are not being able to collect data to study poverty or to study any, any, anything else. So it's, it's a very good idea for efforts uh, that efforts can be done uh, from the academia, academic mm -hmm. point of view to collect this kind of data so that uh, we can produce poverty estimates and we can compare poverty estimates um, over time. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Graciela. Thank you. Fantastic, and I think a great segue to an academic who's going to talk, us, talk to us about collect, data collection efforts. So Mushrik, over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm sorry I walked into the stage late. I couldn't find the building. It's yeah. a, a <laughs> um, so, um, I mean, given the ex excellent presentations we've heard from uh, Ghana and Mexico, I'll do something different. First of all, I won't have slides, uh, but I'll try to focus on how the specific activity that we have in southern Bangladesh in Cox Bazar district um, is, is different, but also how it connects to uh, other efforts. And um, But first, before get in, getting into it, um, I, I, when Rohini Ashwarya, the leadership team here, asked me to do this, I thought it was a fantastic idea to have a plenary session that highlights like data public goods, right? Because often in these conferences, we have like some special talk that's elevated, whereas I, I feel like this is exactly the type of conversation we should be having. And hopefully this incentivizes people to also contribute to various data public goods. Um, but, but I should say more broadly, uh, Rohini Ashwarya, Nick, um, Bestel, Jillian, everybody, fantastic, professionally organized and managed conference. Thank you so much from all of us. Um, okay, so this, the Cox Bazar panel survey, CBPS, it's, um, it's focused on a very unusual and very specific population. Uh, the Rohingya refugees, we had a large influx of Rohingya refugees from Myanmar into Bangladesh in 2017. There were lots of Rohingyas before that, and actually we started a, a data collection process with them even prior to 2017, and then suddenly in the middle of preparing, you know, we had close to a million people who showed up in the matter of a couple of months in a country that wasn't very, very well prepared to handle such a large influx. Um, and, and so, you know, at that point, uh, to Yale leadership's credit, everybody was thinking about, okay, how do we contribute? And that's, we, we decided that maybe we should start asking some questions and collecting some information that might be useful for policy, right? And so that led to, identifying, you know, we need to understand uh, what's happening with this particular population, right? That's important because, I mean, there was gonna be a, a case in the International Court of Justice, right? And it was important that their voices be heard because Aung San Suu Kyi was um, presenting the Myanmar voice, right? And so we needed systematic data. And then the Myanmar's uh, uh, commentary always was, oh, these uh, like journalistic accounts, they're not representative, et cetera. So we wanted to get some representative information about the trauma that the Rohingya had, had, had experienced. But it was also clear to me as soon as I started visiting the area that what happens in five years or 10 years to this population, initially in 2017, everybody was just focused on how do we provide the most basic services, just food and shelter, 
sanitation, water, etc. Right? Everybody was just focused on that as they should have been. That's that's what was needed immediately. But but it was also clear to me that five or ten years, what happens to this population over time, will depend on how local politics changes. Right. So the Bangladesh government made our prime minister made a very brave decision at that point. Um, that yeah, of course we're going to welcome them. We were refugees once, which is true, only fifty years ago. And, and so it's our responsibility to make room. But as soon as people start getting uh, impatient with their presence, because the people who live in the area, they themselves are deprived and poor. Right? So if they start getting impatient and the politics changes, that creates a much more dangerous situation. Right? So therefore, we decided to do the survey not only of the Rohingya, but what we call the host community, so people who are already living there. Um, uh, and then there's a third population of pre-2017 Rohingya arrivals who were trying to, they were, it was illegal for them to be there, but they were trying to kind of send, blend into the population. But, but also to have a contrast, not only the host community that was immediately surrounding the camps, but host communities that were farther away from the camps, just to have that contrast as well. Yeah. Um, and um, so now, let me, let me now get into the details of the data itself. So, so we decided to, in order to create a sampling frame and then have a sample of 5,000 people that we would follow around in a panel, right? We first had to have touch points, like uh, kind of a sampling or, uh, uh, or like a census type exercise. So we had to have touch points with about 55,000 people yeah, or households. So what we ended up doing was, okay, so from those 55,000, we'll choose these 5,000 to, um, uh, to survey intensively over time. And the other 50,000 was, we, we just made it available to researchers saying, look, if you, here's a sampling frame, we've already done that exercise, like something that might be uh, costly, right? Uh, and we would welcome anybody who has ideas on, let's say they want to run interventions that might be beneficial to this population, whether it's cash transfers or psychosocial work, et cetera. So researchers can come in and use that sampling frame and if you want to do intervention-based experimental research, you're allowed to do that, right? And, and it's just the 5,000 households that we wouldn't want to start running interventions in that sample because then they would cease to be representative, right? And that would undermine. So, so we, we created these two subpopulations, 50,000 of people who we could run interventions on versus not, right? And the data are all publicly available. I hope people choose to use it. We are now, we did one round of intensive sort of in-person surveying and then we did multiple, during COVID, we did multiple rounds of phone surveys to continue also maintaining touch points so that we could more easily track them. As you can imagine, this is a population that's gonna be very difficult for us to track over time, precisely because they're mobile and they don't wanna be there. They, they'd like to get out as soon as they can. And in fact, the government relocated a lot of them in a politically contentious decision to a chore area, like a island type area. Um, and, um, Okay, and then the other, uh, the, the other benefit of um, you know, do, having these two subpopulations is that if you end up running interventions in like the, some, you know, in some subsample of the 50,000 people, then what the nice thing is that you have 5,000, uh, our sample households, the panel households, who you, could, uh, who you could use as a very, very large control group, right? So then if you run experiments on, you, know, you choose 200 people or 500 people to run an experiment on somewhere else, you have you automatically as long as we maintain um, uh, measurement consistency in measurement, then you could use uh, you could use that. So again, everyone's welcome to um, uh, to to come and, uh, and and do research here. Um, so uh, yeah, one other thing, one other point I'll mention about the importance of the of a panel. So there was an unintended benefit during the COVID period, which is that. I learned that um, like during COVID suddenly, of course, we had to all, everybody had to stop our in-person data collection activities. But thankfully we had, along with this sample and other areas in Bangladesh, we had a sample of people uh, whose statistical properties we had some understanding of. So we knew what adjustments we'd have to make. Plus um, we had their phone numbers and we also knew that the phones were picked up only three, four months before, right? And so that allowed us to quickly in March, 2020 itself start uh, doing free, high frequent um, uh, high frequency data collection uh, for uh, these populations, and and so that led so for example actually across the Ghana survey and other countries and the Bangladesh surveys we ended up writing a paper. So even though Chris and I were colleagues for a decade, we never managed to write a paper together. He left 
And during the COVID period, we did, right? Uh, thanks, thanks to all this data. Um, and um, okay, so one, you know, uh, so one like sort of tangible example of how the panel uh, uh, panel dimension helps. Now it turns out there's a lot of seasonality, right? Which is not a surprise to any any development economist. Like within within year, there's a lot of variation in people's uh, outcomes. And so COVID just COVID just happened to hit. In some countries, it happened to hit during a good period, like a harvest period, where people had grain stocks. In other countries, there was a pre-harvest period, right? And so we, we were learning. Thankfully, once you have the, a lot of the pre-COVID data, right, you could track. You know, as long as it was high frequency enough, you could track what kind of seasonal variation there was, and that allowed us to say that look, in this country, maybe people aren't suffering so much right now, right? But that's not good news because relative to the same season in a previous year, it was actually really bad news, right? This is why also I think when we all contribute to these kinds of data public goods, they sometimes pay off dividends for, for us um, in unanticipated ways. Um, and the final thing I'll mention is about partnerships. So uh, even though Yale was willing to, for the first round, was willing to pay for the survey um, themselves, we ended up uh, partnering with the World Bank and UNHCR. And that's been very useful because those two organizations, I mean, other than funds and money, they also have really good convening power, right? Which is really valuable. So for example, the way our UNHCR partnership works right now, we figured out that they're not particularly useful in terms of like, statistical decisions, sampling frames, et cetera. But the, the UNHCR country representative is very, very useful in telling us sort of keeping the pulse of like, what is it that we need to know in the next round, right? Mm -hmm. So essentially the partnership we have is that they tell us, okay, here are the policy questions that need to be answered mm -hmm. so that our research team can be responsive exactly to that. And here I should, um, uh, I'm here on stage talking, but the, the person who's over time taken on the lead PI role, Paula Lopez Pena, she's a Queen's University, and she has been maintaining a lot of those relationships. Thank you. I'll stop there. Thanks very much. So we are a bit short of time, but we uh, wanted to take a couple of questions uh, from the audience. But let me start by abusing my privilege as moderator to ask a question um, to the panelists and any subset of them can answer, which is we've heard a lot about um, these fantastic data sets and as Mushfik highlighted, it's really an amazing uh, public good that's being provided to us. But when I put on my hat of thinking about when I'm talking to our students or to young researchers, we always emphasize that, you know, don't start with the data set, start with the question. So I was curious how you would like us to think about that, given that we've been sitting here and sort of saying, here are all these data sets that you should use. So maybe Chris, I'd get you to start. Most of you shouldn't use them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you, you, you get to be driven by your own interests. Um, but if those interests um, coincide. coincide with with the, <coughs> the extremely broad set of data that's being collected in each of these three surveys, it's worth taking a look and just playing around with it. Um, yeah, and so the, yeah, even though your interests might seem very different from what people who have used the data before have done, that doesn't mean it can't be used for what you're interested in. So just take a look. Yeah. Do we have any other? Yeah, I would say in the, the case of the Mexican Family Life Survey, it's a, a very rich database, it has uh, more than 2000 questions. So basically, I mean, you can, there's lots of things and lots of modules that have not been exploited so you can exploit, obviously, the longitudinal component uh, and looking at very, very, very different um, questions. I, I, I say you go and, and dig into um, the web page, and I'm sure you'll find a, a question you're interested in. So, um, so while uh, you know, Rohini uh, framed this as like some tension between you know, data first or, or research question first, right? And I totally get that. You know, my conversations with PhD students, we, we also emphasize the same thing. But I, I don't think it always has to be a dichotomy like that, or it doesn't have to be intention. Mm -hmm. Partly because I am just continually amazed by young researchers, PhD students, um, unbounded capacity for innovation, right? So you have data, and as long as we do the simple, boring things of like, okay, let's just make sure we ask 
all the questions that seem relevant rather than like thinking about what are the interesting questions. Like people come up and then they merge that data with um, like other policy changes or something. And we're amazed at the uh, outcome. So for example, after the, the collecting the cost for our panel survey, right? So I was always trying to think about, okay, how do I merge the Bangladesh side with Myanmar side, given that it's impossible, especially in that particular state in Myanmar where the Rohingya used to live, right? To collect data, but we were able to, you know, uh, one of our PhD students who was here now, Jaya Wen, who's at Harvard Business School. So she knew about, she works on conflict. She knew about the conflict data. Uh, and so we now merged those two and have started uh, thinking about how the propensity for the Myanmar military to engage in genocidal acts, right, varied across different, um, uh, and what the, what the trauma effects were. Anyway, so I'm, I'm not concerned that you'll find fabulous things to do. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even know what they are, but That's the point. We'll, yeah. <laughs> um, we take some questions right there at the back. I think there's someone on the mic. Who, who... Uh, hello, thank you for uh, the talk about the panel. Oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Remy Levin. I'm uh, uh, at the University of Connecticut. I'm extremely happy that you're talking about this because I've used both the IFLS and the MXFLS in my research. And I think they're incredible data sets. One thing that I uh, want to ask you, though, is as far as these longitudinal data sets, one of the kind of primary constraints is how persistent they are over time, right? And so we've now gone a decade without another wave of the MXFLS, and we're coming up on seven or eight years without another wave of the IFLS. And so I'm just wondering if we're ever going to see like new waves of these data sets, because you know, at some point they start getting stale and there's more things I'd like to do with the data. And uh, it would be great if we had more of it, you know? <laughs> yeah. that's, that's my question. So. <laughs> Well, I feel exactly the same. <laughs> um, we did collect like 50% uh, of the data in 2018-19. We're actually trying to work on um, weights in order to be, to be able to use at least that part. What we're doing um, as well is contacting these people via phone. Uh, for the ones that we have phones so that we can sort of keep contact with them. So in, in, in the possibility that we could collect another uh, wave, then it would be easier because I mean, tracking people is, is hard in Mexico, especially now given obviously all the insecurity there is. So, um, so keeping contact with them so that they don't forget about us, it's crucial. So we're trying to do that and we're, uh, doing everything we can to come up with the funds to continue the study because we believe it's it's a unique study, and uh, especially from the Family Life Service, uh, the Mexican Family Life Service has this extra component of tracking individuals to the U.S. So it's it's really unique. Yeah, may I add something? Yeah, very very good. There's a question down there. We can come down. So much. Oh yeah. Um, so I'll just add that um, your point about the phone surveys, it's that, that's something that's become a really big change in the way yeah. that all of us yeah. do research, right? Like the work from home type uh, yeah. regime change that's happened, that's also happened with the way we are surveying things. And it's a great way yeah. to cheaply collect high frequency data yeah. and also maintain contact with the panel of households so that the in-person survey where the finding rates increase. Yeah. Um, I'd love to hear what, um, you all think about doing more individual level stuff in those surveys, the ability to measure individual level poverty, for example, within households, it's very important for all kinds of gender issues, of course. Um, I know there are trade-offs for agriculture, also very important, looking at individual level plots, um, things like that. Just, just wondering what you all think about that. Yes, you're the individual plot person. <laughs> um, so I, I think it depends on the context and the question. And so we're trying, we're striving to collect data at the individual level where we can, and it's relevant. So obviously anthrop anthropometrics is at the individual level. Businesses and farming and income is at the individual level. Consumption, we don't even try um, just because it's too much of a challenge. Although we'd be open to, to adding a module to try to do that in in some subsample, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, this lady behind. 
Thank you. So uh, I wanted to ask a question to Mushfik about this uh, very, very challenging survey among refugees. Um, I was particularly uh, interested to know about the, if you, you got special way to deal with the challenge of tracking those refugees. And also what you mentioned is that you keep this separate uh, sample of 5,000 uh, household or individuals, which you say are perhaps representative. But we know that uh, when people are escaping from violence, they may not want to be uh, found. They may not want to be tracked. So um, what do you do with this? And thanks for your, sure. anyway, your collaboration, which is very, very interesting. On, uh, yeah, those are excellent questions. On the first question of you know, how do you track, it's a particularly difficult population, absolutely, right? Uh, there's no, I mean, there's no magical solution that I can offer. You can, like, how you're imagining it's difficult. It is actually true. It is, it is difficult. Um, now, the, what we are doing is that we actually spend some extra money, some of our budget, in just making almost useless from, our, from the perspective of research phone calls, right? Just to have, like, touch points and conversations and seeing whether they have new SIM cards, right? Um, like, where they live now, who else can we contact? So we're just, the, the only thing we're trying to do is as long as you maintain contact with them on a regular basis, right, it becomes easier to re-find them, mm -hmm. right? And the, the, other, uh, the other point you made about like the population really doesn't want to be tracked. Um, we haven't, in this population, we haven't found that to be a particularly um, like a <laughs> special challenge or anything like that. Uh, for whatever reason, I mean, even though, I mean, they, it's, uh, it, it, they, they don't want to talk for more than two hours, but uh, that's that's been a problem for understandable reasons. Uh, but uh, but like not 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 particularly that you know we're getting a lot of like refusal to participate. Any other questions? I'm just wondering for um, the um, MXLS and for the um, GSPS. If there's opportunities like the ones that Mushvik is um, are is kind of making available, right? So, I mean, I think it's a it's a wonderful initiative. You have you spend all the money in the the, the baseline, which is the most the most expensive part, and then from there, people have access. Like, can people have access to like all the sampling frames to be able to locate? Like, do you make those things available to be able to locate those households to do some other studies? Um, or just the kind of like the identified data that it's publicly available. Because I mean, if those are those opportunities are available, I think that would also make it um, very useful for researchers to kind of do small things here and there using those panels and then moving moving those projects forward. In particularly in Mexico, given the current circumstances, right? I might just jump in and add to that, which is the flip side, which is not just the IRB, but also you know ethically how what kind of how do you think about the taxes you put on people when you enter them into a sample oh, in yeah. the long run yeah. um you're looking at me <laughs> <laughs> um, um I, uh, I'll, I'll hand off to sam in just a second um so the ethical issues are really important um it's it's clear that a determined person could identify a household in our on our sample just from the data that even though it's de-identified. Um, if you were to be a detective, you could go find them. Um, and that's, that's, that's a problem. Um, and uh, that's also the main barrier to just letting the, uh, any researcher join in to do an experiment or add a small module. So what our, our practice has been to bring them into our team, um, go through the IRB, at, at, at Northwestern and, and make an ag agreement uh, with, with the PIs that we'll do this jointly. Um, or, you know, um, the added burden, um, what, what do you say to these, what, 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 how do households respond when we show up for wave three? Yeah, I think um, um, <laughs> you mentioned a thing, which is once we build a rapport with them, it's pretty much easy and we make, or we work with the same um, interviewers. So they know them and they are familiar with them. So it's easier, yeah, getting them to 
participate. And on, on what you asked, um, the opportunities are there, but of course we don't hand the sample to you. You would have to partner and then you won't know where the households are. But once you give us the idea and what you want to do, we think through with you and then with them, uh, experienced and narrators, they give us feedback and then we communicate. So it's more like it works like that. But we won't give the sample to you to go and do what you want to do. Yeah, I think in the case of the MXFLS would be the same. We have to take very good care of our sample, right? So we would be definitely open to working uh, with very different groups but we would have uh, to work together. Uh, we've, done, uh, we've done experiments in the past as well, and it's worked very well. Yeah. Not yeah. that you guys are open oh, yeah. to what is going right? Yeah. yeah. Not out, out chipping. I, I think we currently, the fourth wave of the Ghana panel is ongoing, and we have like um, some PhD students collaborating with us, and then also some other, um, I think, um, uh, you see Beckley? Yeah. Yeah. So we have some other um, teams from UC Berkeley collaborating with us on some studies. So we are very much open. Yeah. I think you talk to Chris. He will get you in. <laughs> so another dimension of the ethics that that's particularly um, that we have to be careful about problematic for us is that we're talking about a population that has recently experienced severe trauma, and um, and asking questions about trauma. So something we had to think carefully about. Um, not that we, I'm not saying we got it right, but I'll just tell you what, uh, what challenges we had, is that you know, if, you, um, if you make people relive their trauma, mm -hmm. does that do longer term damage? Right? Um, and so we had in place, for example, if you're going to ask a, a set of questions that we will have um, you know, uh, support services available should you need it uh, later. But here's something I was surprised by. That um, and even Paula, my co-PI, who is uh, who, who normally works in like psychosocial areas, was surprised by that people were really willing and wanted to share their stories. Right. So we had a so we had a big qualitative component as well of the survey, not just collecting a set of yes/no or numeric responses, um, where we like wrote down sort of narratives of, of their stories. So I think we're out of time. I think Shannon, if you have uh, any instructions to give us for the next stage. <laughs>